Hey campers, Adam Savage here with another one day build from my cave. Uh, and today's one day build involves this bad boy, this drill press, my Powermatic Model 1150, uh, which is one of my favorite tools in this shop. It's all covered with crap right now. But one of the things this drill press does not possess is a crank for raising or lowering the table. And frankly, it's problematic. The Powermatic is problematic. Um, so I went on eBay and I found this. Now, this is a crank for raising and lowering a the table of a Klausing drill press, which is not the same make and model. However, it's meant for a three inch diameter uh, post, which is what my Powermatic, 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 that's the diameter of the post of the Powermatic. So today, yeah, I'm going to take this drill press, bring it out here in the middle of the floor and take it apart. I'm gonna do a, you know, a little this old house with this guy. I'm gonna do a little bit of restoration on this and make it all nice and neat and buttoned up and down. And then uh, when I'm all done, hell's bells, Margaret, I should have a drill press whose table I can raise and lower and lock in place. Won't that be nice? In theory, it's, it, this is a big build. This is, this is gonna take over the middle of this shop for the length of today. Got about five hours, let's go. First, I had to pull the drill press out into the center of the floor uh, so that I could have access to the whole thing. And then I had to be able to lay it down. Now. I am strong, but not that strong. And this thing weighs, I think, 350 pounds. Uh, so I, uh, I moved it instead of like lifting it or putting it up on a dolly, I moved it, I walked it like an Egyptian, uh, like I used to use to move the blast panels. Um, and that, that walking, that rocking is a really stable way to move stuff if you're used to it. Uh, and even more than that, it's really important that you actually push the object away from yourself to walk it. Like don't move it towards yourself and walk it because then you're underneath something that wants to fall on you. If you push it away from yourself to walk it, then its desired failure mode is not on top of you. So I made its desired failure mode away from me. I walked it to the center of the floor. Then I put out a couple of film apple boxes and I laid the, the drill press down on the apple boxes so I could have access to the stock. That's when I measured this and discovered that uh, these two clousing pieces are just a few thousands under what I needed them to be. Being cast iron, they're fairly easy to bore out. So uh, first I chucked this top collar into my milling machine and I indicated it in using a wiggler, uh, which is a device for finding perfect center. And I got it within uh, about one thousandth of accuracy. Given the structure here, I didn't need a uh, uh, one thousandths is plenty for, for this kind of engineering. Once I had it indicated in, it was time to adjust the boring bar so I could pull out those. I think I pulled out like seven or eight thousandths. I think that's what I what I did. give myself a little bit of slop. Uh, and I did that. Uh, I had to do that same operation three times. I had to do it once for the top collar, and then I had to do it twice for this bottom collar because. Uh, because I couldn't go all the way through the thing. I don't have a boring bar that's this long and I don't have a mill that opens up to like 25 inches. So I had to indicate this piece in twice just to bore out the top and the bottom. Um, my one fear, since this piece clamps on, it's got to slice up the backside, you put two bolts in and it clamps on to the dog. My one fear was that I was pulling out too much for it to continue to clamp. However, there is still room in the gap on the back and it holds on to stock really nicely. So uh, I have here now a raisable drill press table and I, I'm actually kind of thrilled about it. I've been belly aching about wanting to do this. Uh, there may be a stage in the future where I attempt to motorize this kind of operation, but that's a whole different build. Um, I'm slowly gathering the parts for that and I may do it and I may not, we'll see. Uh, thank you guys for joining me for this one day build. 
our key pieces of equipment, like our drill presses, these are the pieces that tend to get the most ignored. It's funny that way. They end up being the workhorses that we use every single day, like multiple times per day. And only about two years ago did I indicate the, uh, the, the chunk of my drill press to find that it was out by about four thousandths. And uh, I had to actually pull out the taper, clean it up and put it back in. And then I've got basically almost no run out on it. But again, that's like, that's what we do with our workhorse tools. My drill press is, has a renewed joie de vivre and it's ready to be pressed back into service. The chuck fell off. Now that's not usually that big a deal. Sometimes under different circumstances, the chucks come off. After all, this is a keyless chuck that uh, I think we installed during Mythbuster days. Um, and like a lot of um, mid-range prosumer drill presses, this has a Jacobs taper number 33 uh, on the business end of the drill press spindle. For those of you playing at home, my drill press is a Powermatic Model 1150A floor standing model. It's a great drill press, variable speed. I love this thing. But when my chuck fell off, I noticed something really wrong with the Jacobs taper that interfaces with the chuck. Now, taper, tape, Jacobs tapers are meant to be uh, somewhat self-supporting. That is that um, when the two sides meet, they provide their own bond, but these drill presses also have these threaded rings to add to that bond. And when a drill chuck is chucked onto the 33 taper and threaded on here, it's not going anywhere. And normally if you're just doing drill pressing like this, it doesn't go anywhere anyway. But if you try and use your drill press as a spindle sander, if you try and put a lateral pressure on the chuck, well, if your chuck doesn't have the threads that interface with the machine, it can fall off. That's exactly how that happened to me. The reason I am filming this repair is because those of us who have shops and use tools of every stripe uh, often have to repair those tools or replace them. And learning which is necessary is really important to your pocketbook and to your overall well-being of a shop, honestly. So I thought I'd walk you through the process. Here I discover that one of the most key and important tools in my shop uh, is damaged. Oh, right. See, okay, I haven't yet done a close-up. The chuck fell off and then, check this close-up out, look at my 33 Jacobs taper. Yeah, it's... It's farted. That is, look, everything about a taper is that the two mating surfaces want to be pristine. They want to be just untouched. You want to clean them so well, you don't want any debris because if you have debris, you have run, you, you'll end up with run out. You don't want run out in your drill press. You want a nice tight bond, mechanical, yeah. This tells me that this was run off angle for a long time. And there's no like filing this back into submission. That is a temporary solution at best. So what do I do when one of my key tools is injured? Well, the first thing I do is I start to do a Google, a YouTube search for repair of that tool. Um, and I have almost always found the repair I needed for my bridge port and my lathe, that stuff abounds. But for this drill press, for some reason, uh, actual teardown videos and repair videos, specifically of the spindle, are, in my opinion, I, I couldn't find them. So then, uh, finding nothing there, I did some general watching of videos about repairing spindles and drill presses, and that was informative. That helped me understand the language. Um, and once I understood the language, I could look at an exploded parts diagram, which I did a search, Powermatic Model 1150A exploded parts diagram, found it, found the name and number of this part, went to Powermatic's website where they said, enter in the name of your part and we'll find it. I entered in the name of the part and they were like, yeah, we don't make those anymore. <laughs> so the part that I want can't be bought through a parts reseller. Uh, and I can't find a way to repair this one piece, what the hell am I going to do? Well, I, I actually got really lucky in this regard. 
Because while I was doing eBay searches for bits and bobs of the 1150A Powermatic Drill Press, I found a guy who was parting out a model 1150A. And lo, he was not simply parting out the spindle, which would have been nice, he's parting out the entire spindle lowering arrangement. Yeah, that is fantastic. This cost me 180 bucks and it should fix all my woes. And look, it looks like it's got the original chuck on here. Uh, again, with the threaded part that couples to this threaded part, right? So I'd be replacing this entire thing. Um, I am open to suggestions, by the way. If anybody watching knows where I could purchase, I'm gonna purchase another, uh, oh, by the way, right? This is screwed, which means that inside here is also screwed. I can feel it with my pinky. This is, this is no longer a drill chuck, this is a piece of garbage. It looks like a drill chuck, but it's no good anymore. It won't ever fully perfectly couple. I mean, I guess you could sort of, I can't fix this. So that's a piece of garbage. If you know of a keyless chuck that also has this threaded part, I am all ears. I'm not above like machining my own onto the end of a keyless chuck if that's the solution that it comes to. But I, I would really like the ability to use my drill press as a spindle sander without worrying that this will fall off. So for right now, I'm gonna live with a Jacobs chuck and a chuck key for the first time in 10 years. Um, simply because, honestly, I don't think this has been removed from this spindle since the Eisenhower administration. Um, I can see on the collar evidence that it has been removed maybe once or twice over its lifespan, but clearly not in a long time. So until I find the keyless chuck of my dreams, this will have to suffice. So how do I put this in, right? How do you take apart your uh, machine? Well, that's when I do a special Google search for Model 1150A Powermatic Repair Manual. And lo, I hit pay dirt. Uh, honestly, even though I do tons and tons of research online, it's infrequent that I find precisely the exact thing that I'm looking for, but here it is. This is, this is a really basic model for Powermatic. They made, I don't know if they still make this one, but they made this model for decades, which means that the repair manuals are very cross compatible. And in this is a literal step-by-step -step guide for removing the old spindle bore arrangement and replacing it with another one, which I now have. So we're gonna film this today. That was a long preamble. Okay, so let's get started. I hate the idea that I don't like throwing stuff out, even though I said this is garbage and I really feel like it's garbage. I don't like throwing it out. It's funny, right? Anyway, I'm not gonna throw it out right away. Put it right there. Uh, so let's see what the instructions say. Here on page, basic operation, replacing spindles on quill assembly. I love this. Replacing spindles on quill assembly. A lovely three-step process. So first up is loosening the spring return. So hold quill return housing in left hand. See figure seven. This is figure seven. That's the quill housing number B. All right. And loosen lock screw A. Lock screw A. Okay, so I'm looking at this from the underside. Lock screw A is that guy right there. Let spring unwind slowly by allowing housing to turn in hand. Ah, okay, that's an Allen key in there. So I've got to go get that Allen key. Nope, let's see if I got it on the second try. Nope, ha <laughs> ha, all right. I just cannot get Allen keys. Okay, so, oh, you know what, I wanna mark that. Mark that there, because I want to bring it right back to that location. There is a whole separate part of the repair manual for putting back in a spring, and I will look that up once I'm repairing this. Okay, there we go. Letting it unwind, that's one turn. 
That's two turns. And, ah, now the, okay. So from tension, it's twice around. Loosen set screw C in figure six and remove nut on bottom of depth stop rod. Oh, okay. Let's see. Let's see if I get this on the first try. Hey! I did. Okay. Oh. Great. Come on. Great. I got it. Uh, it turned out I was right. Yeah, the drill, the uh, the set screw had munged the edge here of this little channel meant for it, and thus it was not releasing itself. So now I have the depth stop rod off of the spindle. What's next? Lower quill assembly to the position where the turret pinion shaft, E, Okay, this is the turret pinion shaft, and I'm supposed to lower it until it can be removed, but let's pull this out to see. Apparently there's a, 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 a depth to lower this to in which this can come out. So let's just see if I can get there. Ah, okay, I see another. So uh, one thing that I'm dealing with is I may be using a manual for a machine that's slightly a different vintage than this. So it appears that there is a, right, there's a nut I missed here. It seems to hold. Let's see if this works as advertised. So that's that one. Wow, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, oh. Wow, that is far out, man. That is that is way simpler than I thought it was going to be. Holy cow. Okay, so pop that out. And now this, look at that. Holy, um, I will say at one point, Jamie's variable speed drill press, uh, it, it wasn't me that broke it. It was not me that broke it but he had a big Deming bit on it and the Deming bit caught on a piece of material and bent and bent the whole spindle shaft. And I remember one of Jamie's guys, uh, Brad, spending like days taking apart this thing. So I've been terrified of this repair. I had no idea it was like loosening four screws and then this whole thing would just drop out. Um, this is awesome. Uh, and let's just see, let's just see. Yup, they are in every way the same exact part. Um, except that the one that I bought looks way better than the one that's been in my machine forever. This is this is really nice. I, I, I... Okay, right, so that's where you lower it to and that allows you to pull out that whole business. Oh, look at that. And that's the, uh... oh, I see, said the blind man. Now I get it. As long as I'm uh, taking this thing apart, I figure I might as well go through the parts and the pieces and make sure they're as clean and uh, in good shape as they need to be. Let's get some WD-40. Okay. Oh man, decades of crap caked in here. It 
it's time to reverse the order of these things and to retire once and for all this spindle and replace it with this one. I cannot tell you. So this is the other thing is, is that in the manual, they talk about checking for play. There is no play. This spindle is in fantastic shape. And this, to be honest, I mean, if you look at this drill chuck, you can just see, like, yeah, this didn't spend its life at a school. Let's just put it that way, where tools get really abused. A light film of oil applied to the quill and to the column. Yes. I'm just going to give this a little spritz and this too. Great. And yeah, that is a light film. Ooh. Huh. That seems tougher than it should be. 2.185, and the original is 2.185. They're the same measurement. So there's no reason it shouldn't go back in. Let's loosen this, because I'll bet that that is germane to, yeah, I'll bet that's exactly, I'll bet you tighten this until you've removed all the play. You know, there's another thing I'd like to say about good tools, is that one of the reasons you invest in good tools, one of the reasons to pay real money for good tools, is uh, the ease of repair. The better tool companies, to be honest, make their tools easier to repair. Um, I'm a big believer in the right to repair movement. I think it's really important that we get to, uh, that we get to modify ourselves, the things that we purchase. Um, I've been a staunch supporter, and they've made great strides uh, in the States in the past few years uh, on the heels of uh, John, John Deere attempting to sell farmers farming data without their concession. Uh, but the latest fight for right to repair is in hospital equipment, and uh, iFixit is dealing with that right now, along with my great friends at the EFF. Um, but all this uh, a long way of saying the best tools are the ones that are the easiest to repair. And Powermatic, honestly, they've made this impressively simple as a transaction. All right, come on. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So still not getting any movement. You know what? Um, I kind of want to... There we go. Okay, that was a little better. Uh, I want to get a dead one. All right, uh, I had too much garbage on the table of the drill press and it's actually making it hard to work. So I'm gonna move over my parts and pieces and tools. And that, that, right, that's that, that. Oh, I don't even need that. That sits in. As always, I follow Robert Piercing's advice from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is to place your parts in the orientation in which they went into the machine or came out of the machine, so you have the memory of where they're supposed to go. Uh, all right, so let's move this guy out of the way. So what I what I noticed here is as I was installing it, it got tight, and then I can tell that this still moves in the column, but this is tight, and that tells me that my spindle has now interacted with the uh, variable speed pulleys, and I'm just like slowly putting it in. It's not taking a lot. Um, again, if you're gonna hammer on a drill chuck, you wanna make sure that the jaws are, yeah, the jaws are retracted, uh, and you don't wanna hit it with anything hard. Um, just gonna gently coax the whole thing back into its orientation. Oh. 
Okay, so. I forgot. I have to put in. There. Oh, 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 okay. So. Yeah, this is a, this is a thing. I'm going to get some light oil on you as well. And we're going to <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this goes in like that. Oh, right, because I can't get it past that. I see. Right, if that's in, then it won't move past the right. So I gotta get it to where it does get past the. Too far in. Oh, oh, okay, awesome. I think it's time to start putting these pieces back together. First one is this guy, which locks. What is this thing called? This thing is called the turret pinion shaft. So uh, this, oh, no, the uh, set screw that I'm putting in has a little uh, has a little shoulder on it. Sorry about that. Has a little shoulder on it. So uh, the technique for putting it in is to put it in all the way, and I can feel it hitting. Yeah, and then pulling it back just a little bit, and then tightening the nut in that exact position. So, great. And just to make sure that is, that's good. And I have smooth movement, smooth movement. Okay, so the next step is, let's put in this guy. And you know what, I'm gonna get a socket for that. Now my guess is if I tighten this down a lot, it's gonna lock the spindle. All right. Yep, so we're gonna back it off. Back it off! That's a little not enough. That's it, okay, that's backed off until it moves. And then we pop in spindle lock. That's the spindle lock. So. That didn't have, no, it didn't. All right, so. Spindle lock, yep, that's in and that's out. Great, so I'm gonna lock that so it doesn't drop down anymore. And now, now I have to look through the manual for reinstalling the spring because the return spring for drill presses and mills, well, it can be an area where you can get into trouble. Time to install the quill return spring. This should be interesting. I am going to actually install the depth stop first because I want to stop on this. I don't want this to fall on me, so I'm going to install the depth stop, and that will keep this thing from falling back out if it has a desire to do so. Oh, it is so nice. I'm literally giving my drill press another 50 years of use with this repair. That feels really good. Okay, so now I can feel that my set screw is in the channel. And unlike the last person to repair the other spindle, I'm gonna make sure it's right in the middle before tightening it. There we go. That's great. Excellent. Now we're also going to get this guy on here. This guy goes in here. Oh. Let's 
lower this. Oh, can I say how much I was dreading this repair and how glad I am how well it went? I mean, you know, I don't mean to start to singing the praise, singing my own praises yet, because there's a lot that could go wrong, but right now it looks pretty positive. Yep, plenty of clearance. Let's just give that one more little. Ah, yeah, it's wonderful. Good. Now it won't go anywhere. And what I can do is I can adjust. Oh, right, right, right. So uh, the flats on this thing are on the underside of, let's see, they're at 90. Okay, so there's two flats on the spring return here, and they're at 90 degrees to the starting hole. So I'm going to go up. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah. Let me get this up in there first. This is the set screw, which will... Now, my set screw is ready. I'm going to wind this once, and I think if I wind it a second time, yeah, I think that'll be enough. So then, I tighten this guy in. And because I've made my mark, it's back to the factory preset. Let me pop in this. Is that it? Yeah, so it is. Yep. Okay, so what am I forgetting? Are there any parts here that I didn't start with? <laughs> uh, the answer is, oh, let's turn it on. Yeah, here's a moment of truth. Sounds good. Ah, so what I will now do is I will hole punch this and put it in a binder that I keep. Said binder has all of the repair manuals and instruction manuals that I have gathered over the years for all of my tools. I appreciate that all of this stuff is findable online and yet nothing beats a hard copy and frankly, now, I love the fact that th these two pages where I did the work have like my grease stains all over them. This now tells a story of a successful repair. This beautiful machine is ready for another 30 years of active duty service. That is just great. Just grand. And uh, yeah. I'm really pleased. Thank you guys for joining me for this one day shop repair. Uh, and if you have other, uh, other resources for tool repair manuals or aspects of this uh, of this repair that I mentioned but clearly don't know a certain key thing about, please let me know in the comments. There we go. See you guys next time. Thanks for watching that video. If you'd like to support us further, you can head over to our merch store and get a poster like this one. This is my sketch of uh, a gauntlet, but it's not just a sketch of a gauntlet. I use drawing as a tool for figuring out problems. Um, and I have drawn this to help you solve the problem of how to make a gauntlet. I've made it a kind of instructional and pattern guide for making an entire gauntlet from scratch. But you don't have to, you could just frame it and hang it on your wall if you like, the choice is yours. It's printed on a beautiful heavy cardstock and you can purchase your own by following the links below.